You know, I did not think much about adoption when I was young. I suppose it had to do with my lack of exposure. Families with two uh, parents with their biological children was the norm in my world. But I began to think a little bit when Stephanie and I initially had struggles having children. But then the thought became more real in March of 1999. Our nephew, the oldest of the grandchildren and one born several months before our oldest child, uh, he died. His name was Zach. He was 20 months old when he died. And no one knew it initially, but he was born with a rare genetic disease that the medical community simply did not know how to treat. I remember the funeral, carrying the casket, and seeing grief like I had not experienced to that point. And the Lord often uses grief to chart new paths. Today, almost one out of every two of our nieces and nephews are adopted by one, if not both, parents. And in addition, we've been around over the years to see many adoption stories in our ministry. And every time there's an adoption, there's a new opportunity, a new lease on life, a new story waiting to be written. And it's worth celebrating and getting excited about. So today's message is a happy message, a happy day. We're going to be talking about our spiritual gotcha day or finalization day or adoption day. Pick the term that you like. Now, I know that I have a unique skill. I can make any party depressing. <laughs> I seem to have a face that just naturally says you're an idiot. I didn't plan it that way. It's just how it is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work really hard today to smile throughout the entire message. I I'm going to be consciously thinking, when is the last time I smiled? Now, here's what you need to do. You need to have a party in your heart. All right, that sound like a deal? You need to have a party in your heart. With that in mind, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. That's on page 150 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. Our annual theme is building upon our heritage. The Lord has given us 60 years, and we're asking how we can appreciate the past while also look forward to the future that the Lord has for us. And we thought the book of Ephesians would be a great place to study this year to think about those ideas. It begins with an astonishing truth. Praise God for blessing us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I mean, you read it and it just stops you in your tracks. Wait a minute, what? If we know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, then this says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Praise God for that response, huh? In fact, some of the younger generations might say, let's go, let's go, praise God, let's go. Well, you know, the Lord chooses to tell us different aspects of the salvation prospects that we have received, who we are in Jesus. And that's why we titled this first series, Remembering Our Identity as One in Christ, because we wanted to draw attention to what does the Lord say about us. He calls us saints. He calls us chosen. And now, this morning, we're going to be talking about he's called us sons and daughters. That is, we are adopted in Christ. I'm going to read verses 3 through 12. Please follow along as I read. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, 
he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. We're talking about spiritual adoption. And that means it's the act at salvation whereby God places the believer in his family. I love seeing on Facebook adoption day or finalization day or gotcha day when you see this family and everyone's all dressed up and the judge has officially declared that particular child as a member of that family. They celebrate because something amazing just happened. Maybe we should say some things amazing just happened. For the purpose of our study this morning, it's spiritual adoption on the day of our conversion. And I would like us to think about five truths about our spiritual adoption that ultimately should result in praise and adoration for the Lord. Number one is our adoption welcomes us into a new family. In verse 5, it says that he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Well, that means if we are welcomed into a new family, then we must have been part of an old one. I belong to something prior to my adoption into the Lord's family. So what is that? Now, I realize that saying that people are not born into God's family is a hard reality. We even have children's songs that sort of encourage us to believe that everyone is. It's a cute little tune, Father Abraham. We all know Father Abraham. He had, what do you have? Yeah, he had many sons, and many sons then had Father Abraham. And I am one of them, and so let's just praise the Lord. Now, if we're all talking about believers, that is a great song. The challenge is, what about those who are not yet sons of Abraham? The Bible tells us that all who place their faith in Jesus are sons of Abraham. That's in Galatians 3. That means that we are descendants of Abraham's faith, and we are justified by faith just as he was. However, Galatians 3 also made the point that not everyone who is a descendant of Abraham is a son of Abraham. It's also a reminder that not every child born into a Christian home or adopted by Christian parents is automatically a child of God or a child of Abraham. Pastor Byers has said many times, God has no grandchildren. So part of what makes adoption so wonderful is that you were and your family heritage wasn't quite so good before your conversion. In fact, Paul uses son terminology, sonship terminology to explain what family you were a part of. In Ephesians 2, it says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were once part of the sons of disobedience, the children of wrath, living according to the will of the devil. And as a result, we were the family under God's wrath, along with all others who were in that same state as we were. In Paul's life and in our own, 
We did not need compelled to sin. We were already willing. It was part of our nature. And our brothers and sisters did the same. We did it with ease and without guilt. It was our core identity. But God did something. He predestined us to be part of the family, a subject that Pastor Pastor Oakland covered last week. When the time was right, the Lord moved. We who were outside of his family and household were compelled with an invitation to join his. And Ephesians, again, describes what happened in that moment. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. Do you see what happened during that day? Go back to the day of your conversion, the day that it all clicked. You heard about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ before, And it was like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, cool. But on that day, you were compelled to act. On that day, you chose to believe. On that day, you realized that believing in Jesus is not just accepting him as a historical figure. But instead, you realized your need to place your faith and trust in Jesus alone as your only hope of salvation. Do you know, last Sunday, that actually happened in the service at 9.30. An individual was adopted. It was gotcha day, redemption day for someone here last Sunday. They'd heard the gospel many times. Many times. Yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, okay, whatever. But January 28th was the day of his adoption in the Lord's family. And that might be the need for you today. Some of us are rejoicing like, man, we got transferred to a new family. Yes, praise God for that. And others are thinking, I'm not sure I've been transferred yet. Well, if that's true for you, you've heard the message You've heard it, and the response is like, okay, cool. And we're encouraging you today to see it differently. To see it as the day that you need to repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. This week, the author of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist came to Purdue to demonstrate that faith is something that everyone exercises. The atheist exercises his religious convictions, namely that there is no God on the basis of faith. He says, you you must live by faith. It's impossible to live without faith. You just have to decide which faith you accept. And the only compelling argument is faith in the God of the Old and New Testaments, who says that we were born as sons of disobedience, doing the will and works of our father, the devil, that our sin separates us from a holy God. But God, being rich in mercy, loving us with great love, sent him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I urge you to acknowledge your sin and unworthiness I implore you to see yourself as small in light of the creator of the universe and to place your faith in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ that today might be your gotcha day, your finalization day. When that day happened, or when it still is yet to come, Again, Ephesians tells us a little bit about what happens. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are members of God's household. See, suddenly our core identity has changed. 
We get a new father, new siblings. We're no longer aligned with the sons of disobedience. We're now brothers and sisters in Christ with whom Jesus himself is the first among many brethren. And the condemnation that Jesus gave to those who do not know Jesus, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father, is no longer true. But instead... But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name, who were born not from blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So that creates some things that are then true for us. Our new family is a present reality and independent of our own thoughts, words, and deeds. Now, at first that might seem strange. Like, why phrase it like this? Because sometimes believers struggle with who they are. They get lost and wonder their purpose or value and then struggle with all sorts of worries and discouragements and despair. But here's the reality. When we become children, we're always a child. You know, the three children that were born in our home are greens, and they can never change that. There is nothing that they can do that changes that identity. We love them as our children, whether they do things that please us and encourage us or whether they do things that disappoint us. And if that's true for us, how much more true Is it for the Lord? Here's what he says about his family. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Man, our response is praise God for that. Praise God that he set his affections on us and that's why we're a family member. So rather than live as a ball of discouragement or worry or despair, we can rejoice in our new family relationship. It should also be obvious at this point then that we're also part of a different family. See, if we're in Christ, we know that there is nothing we can think, say, or do or fail to think, say, or do that would change that status. Once a person is in Christ... There's no removing that person from that relationship. However, if we're in Christ, our thoughts and behavior should change. It would be odd, for example, to be an adopted son of the king and living as once did in their previous life, as a slave of sin and Satan, aligning himself with the world's values. Romans 8 shares the importance of living faithfully to this new identity, again, emphasizing the issue of sonship. If we were all being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, again leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. I just love that. The term Abba was a term of endearment, maybe close to daddy, and it designates the closeness of a relationship. And you know, in the storyline of the Bible, there was distance between people and God. Moses had to remove his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. Isaiah proclaimed that he was undone as he stood in the presence of the Lord. The average person worshipped God from a distance. The Holy of Holies was only accessible once a year by one person. The holy place was restricted to priests. Even the temple grounds demanded that they were Israelites. There was distance between them and God to demonstrate that God wasn't like them. They were not divine buddies. 
And they, the sacrificial system was a constant reminder that you could not come to God without payment for your sin. Now that Christ has come, adoption is available, and the distance between God and his children are now closed. We no longer relate to God through the intercessory work of a priest, through barriers of walls and curtains to the holy and holy of holy places, relate to God through the killing of animals as an atonement for our sin. One of the great gifts of adoption is being able to go directly to Abba, Father. When a person is adopted into the family of God, they have an attentive father who is concerned about them. That changes everything. And I hope you just think about that and say, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that that is true. Thank you that you took me from the son of the devil and made me a son of the king. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to call you Abba Father rather than maintaining a distance. Well, if that's not enough, we also become like him. We become like him. I've used throughout this message, and will continue to do so, human adoption as an analogy. But even human adoption falls somewhat short. John MacArthur wrote these words on Ephesians 1.5. Human parents can adopt children and come to love them every bit as much as they love their natural children. They can give an adopted child complete equality in the family life, resources, and inheritance. But no human parent can impart his own distinct nature to an adopted child. Yet that is what God miraculously does to every person whom he has elected and who has trusted in Christ. He makes them sons just like his divine son. Christians not only have all the son's riches and blessings, but all of the son's nature. We are told that he is conforming us into the image of his son reminding us that there is going to come a day, John put it this way, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as, appeared as what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. Isn't spiritual adoption awesome? Aren't you thinking, man, thank you, Lord, for gotcha day. Thank you for finalization day. Thank you for adoption day. A second truth is our adoption came at a high price. The words of Ephesians, he predestined us to adoption as sons. Notice the next words, through Jesus Christ to himself. Only a few words, but full of meaning. At times, I have bristled. I imagine you have too. When you hear the cost of adoption, I realize that sometimes adoptions occur without a payment. However, a quick Google search said the low end for adoptions was $25,000. We know when a family chooses to adopt, they choose to make sacrifices of various kinds. There is a cost associated. So what is the cost of spiritual adoption. What price had to be paid for you and I to become a child, a son or daughter of God? We see it was through Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood. You see, there was no other way. How can God's wrath against sin, against our sin, be satisfied? How can a holy God be just in rescuing anyone? And that's where Hebrews reminds us it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to, protect the, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. Isaiah 53 says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our spiritual adoption was not paid for in cash. It had to be paid through his death because our adoption could only occur through Jesus Christ to himself. Well, what might be some implications of that? I hope first it elicits gratitude in your heart, that that there is a party going on in your heart, just thanking God. In fact, there are all sorts of prayers happening right now, just going up from all of you to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for me that I might be called a a daughter or a son of God. I hope it reminds us of the severity of our sin so that we might not continue in it. We see the cost that was paid and we say, oh, I want to deal with my sin. I hope it results in worship and praise. How deep the Father's love for us. This is a song we were singing earlier. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. I hope you would also say, man, I want to live faithful. I want to live faithful. If this is what the Lord has done for me, wow. Wow, that's amazing. I want to live faithful. Galatians 4 tells us when the fullness of time came, God sent forth the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Here's number three. Our adoption occurs because of his kind intention. That's what the end of verse 5 says according to the kind intention of his will. Have you ever received a gift and wondered if the person was compelled to give it to you? Like, this is my duty to give this gift to you. Let's say you bought a Christmas present for a person a couple of years ago, and they'd never gotten you anything before, and that you were totally good with that. You didn't care. You just wanted to bless them. But then the next year, they bring you something. And you're like, this is weird. This has never happened before. And you start to wonder, do they actually feel obligated to do so? Coerced. I love this about verse 5. There's no part of the adoption process that was forced or coerced. None of it. The Lord was not regretting his decision to put this plan in motion. He was not forced to bring it about. He was not coerced once he started it. Your adoption, my adoption. The adoption that we hope to see yet this year as individuals place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone is not a result of coercion, but instead is a picture of God's divine kindness. He delights in his plans. Was there a cost? Yes. Was it well worth it? Yes, he's doing exactly as he intended. And isn't it amazing that God would delight in his purpose to crush his son so that he could bring many sons and daughters to glory? Man, if that doesn't get us excited, I I don't know what would. We have a new family a new father who is attentive and caring. We see the cost associated with it. We know it was through the kind intention of his will. And then there, there's some more additional blessings. And, and I, I'm going to call this a unique privilege. I didn't know exactly how to phrase this. I'm going to let Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology explain the thought process and then just let us soak in its glory. Although adoption is a privilege that comes to us at the time we become Christians, nevertheless, it is a privilege that is distinct from justification and from regeneration. In regeneration, we are made spiritually alive. 
able to relate to God in prayer and worship and able to hear his word with receptive hearts. But it's possible that God could have creatures who are spiritually alive and yet not members of his family and do not share the special privileges of family members. Angels, for example, apparently fall into that category. Therefore, it would have been possible for God to decide to give us regeneration without the great privileges of adoption into his family. He goes on, moreover, God could have given us justification without the privileges of adoption into his family. For he could have forgiven our sins, given us a right legal standing before him without making us his children. It's important to realize this because it helps us to recognize how great are our privileges in adoption. Regeneration has to do with our spiritual life within. Justification has to do with our standing before God's law. But adoption has to do with our relationship with God as our Father. And in adoption, we are given many of the greatest blessings that we will ever know for all eternity when we begin to realize the excellence of these blessings and when we appreciate that God has no obligation to give us any of them, then we will be able to exclaim with the Apostle John, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. This is mind-blowing. God could have redeemed us, something we'll talk about later, and forgiven us, something else we'll talk about later, without making us part of his family. The more I thought about this, I was looking for an analogy. How, how could I get my head around this one? And then it, an idea popped in my mind. Oh, wait a minute. I, I got it. Earlier this year, Stephanie and I were having a conversation. It was before Christmas. And she wanted to get new stockings. We had a hodgepodge of them. We bought them as our kids were born and that sort of thing. So it, it was time, she thought, for a new set of stockings. There were two important questions we had to answer. The first one was, how many should we buy? We have three children, and then one of them got married, so we got a new daughter-in-law, so we know we need at least four. But then... Samuel could get married someday, so should we buy a fifth one in anticipation of that? And then Mackenzie could get married someday, so should we buy a sixth one just in case? Because after all, they all need to match. <laughs> of course they need to match, right? So we thought, well... The odds of us finding this stocking at some point later, like when the other kids get married, is relatively low, maybe non-existent. So we thought, well, the worst thing we can do is buy extra stockings that we don't need. So we decided we're buying six. Then another very important question came up. Because we're, we're happy. I mean, if our kids are are dating seriously, then we are happy for their dates to come and that we would have gifts for them. We would have a stocking for them. But the, the question that we had to answer is who gets their name on a stocking? <laughs> who gets their name on a Like we can bless people, right? That's fine. We can give them stockings, but who gets their name on a stocking? And we decided the answer to that is family. Family gets the name on the stocking. So boyfriend, girlfriend, we're happy for them to come over. We're happy to buy them gifts, but no name on the stocking. <laughs> when you put a ring on it and you covenant before God, now that's different. Now, now you get your name on the stocking. Don't tell me you guys haven't had any of these conversations. I, I know you have. You're looking at me like I'm crazy or something. No. Using my little analogy, isn't it amazing that God not only saved us, but he gave us a stocking with our name on it? That's mind-blowing. He could have just said, you know, you can come to heaven. You can enjoy it. 
but you don't get your name on a stocking. You, you get to be blessed, but you don't, you're not family. Truly amazing that the Lord would choose to adopt us, not simply regenerate us or justify us. We have with that sonship then an inheritance. We saw it in verse 11. We have obtained an inheritance, and we saw it earlier in Galatians 4. And here's the larger passage. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elementary things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that we might re- he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Okay, so we read that. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, we've seen that too. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So what then does an heir receive? And we look at a verse like Romans 8.32, and we start to wonder, okay, maybe I got this now. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That is everything that God has promised. I sometimes have a hard time imagining what heaven will be like. I relate to the song, I Can Only Imagine. Because the Bible in Revelation 21 and 22 describes a world I don't live in. No more tears. No more pain. No more crying. No more death. That's not the world that we have right now. It's hard to imagine. But it's amazing. It's amazing that that's what the Lord would choose to give us. The final truth about adoption we're going to consider this morning is our adoption is final. Gotcha day. Some prefer the term finalization day. Because it's the day when the family goes to the courthouse and the judge declares that person officially a member of a new family. And when that happens, everyone gets dressed up and celebrates together this new addition to their home. Do you know in heaven it's much the same? In Luke 15, we're told, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, brothers and sisters, fellow adoptees and family members, let's rejoice. Let's have a party in our heart. Because he chose to adopt us, to take us out of the family we were part of, the sons and daughters of disobedience living under the control of our father, the devil, and has given us an attentive compassionate father instead that it came at a high price the cost of his own son that it was done not by coercion but according to the kind intention of his will let's stand in awe at the blessings that he provides and praise him that our adoption is final and no one can snatch us out of his hand. And I encourage you to be praying, thanking God for that, inviting people, inviting people to hear the message of the gospel. If you say, well, I'm nervous about sharing it myself, I, we understand. Invite them here. We'll share it. And then, Do the best you can to witness to those who are lost around you. Because I think we'd like to see some more adoption days, don't you? We want to see some more spiritual adoption days. 
What does it result in? Ah, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of spiritual adoption. Thank you that salvation has so many different aspects to it that each time we look at one, it's just amazing. Thank you that you call us saints. Thank you that you have chosen us. Thank you that you've adopted us. And as a result of our adoption, we have the freedom to call you Father, knowing that you care, knowing that you are going to help, knowing that we can trust your plan, and knowing that there is a future for us that is so good, it's hard to imagine. Lord, I also thank you for the privilege that you give us to worship to thank you now for those realities. Thank you for the chance we'll have tonight to celebrate communion together where we especially thank you and praise you looking for your return. Lord, we pray that you would use us to help others see their need for Christ. Would you help us to be the kind of person that's so joyful and encouraged that people around us wonder why we are that way? And it gives a chance to share the hope of our calling. Lord, we're asking that you would use us this year to bring many sons and daughters to glory. We're asking that the baptismal will be filled each church family night because people are repenting of their sin and placing their faith in Christ alone. So, Lord, we're asking for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.